Uh, and here's how we'll do it. Jeff will uh, just talk us through this. Okay, so we're going to show a couple of uh, workshops, mine and George's. I won't tell you which one round they are. You'll probably guess. Um, <laughs> do you want to? Do you want to go back to? Yeah. Um, then an interactive session so that the you participants can start to look at what what may what may be uh, things worth looking at and paying attention to um, and have we covered everything that's, that's there what can we do about it where are we going to get our information from if we need some outside information and again what should the club be doing um, what responsibility should the club have etc Okay, so let's have a look at the uh, couple of workshops. And don't laugh too loudly, please. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're giving the game away here. <laughs> so, Would you prefer that we mute before laughing? Yeah, I, I think you should mute. You should do something. Cry. That's my workshop. Oh, it's so bright. <laughs> With sunglasses. Uh, it's, not, it's on a thumbnail. Do you want to put it on screen? A mess. Can we make it bigger? Oh, Needs a cling. Stuff everywhere. George, George could you start it again? Because um, the, the commentary is very muffled, uh, especially if you come through uh, 10, 10, 15 seconds further in. Can you make it full screen? Oh. It looks chaos at the uh, moment. Can I make it full screen? Uh, how do I do that? With sunglasses. One to the right. This is a mess. The middle one. Sander needs a clean. Stuff everywhere over the floor. Try the, the right one, the right one. The right hand icon. No, that's gone all together now. I said, no, right, right a bit. The roof's been close no. now. Uh, no, I've lost it completely. Files. Sorry about this. This is uh... grinding area. Linisher. Quite useful, that one. Who's talking Lave. about Band saw. Compound table. Right. Should have been put away a long time ago. Uh, right. I think, here. Adam, are you going to try showing it? I did send you a copy earlier. Of oh, the video? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it really needs a massive tidy up. Those shelves I put up. Who's talking? talking it's not just right working now. as well as it ought to here, I'm afraid. Sorry. It was working yeah. earlier. There's a lot it was. Do. I'll see how much I can get done uh, uh, in time for a little demo. I shall be upgrading this video. Let's quit that and let's try again. Sorry about this. Who's uh, talking in the background? I think, I think they've got the drift. <laughs> yeah, chaos, chaos, absolute yeah. chaos. Uh, let's try the other one, see whether the other one works any better. Increase the size. That's it. Okay. Look at my workshop. Okay. Of the health and safety issues that I have or have not addressed. Coming in, ah. first tool I come across in the workshop is the pillar drill, where, as you'll see, I've removed the safety guard around the chuck and replaced it with a laser guide. I couldn't attach the laser guide to the pillar because it's a radio drill. But in any event, I don't think that the safety guard served any purpose other than to get me across as it kept getting in the way. Mm -hmm. Moving on, other equipment has safety guards and normal safety processes. I would always have something between my eyes and the blade on the uh, on the bandsaw. Uh, highly dangerous, as some members of the club can uh, certify. Moving on past the lathe to one of the key points. I've inserted a consumer unit with an RCD on the power cable as it comes into the garage. Oh, there is an RCD on the main circuit board in the house, but this is a double protection. 
And in any event, as I've discovered, this will trip without switching all the power off in the house. I also put a ring main in to spread the power around. Um, pulling back slightly, thinking of the uh, dust, I have a respirator helmet with filters to keep out the, uh, the dust. Also to keep out the dust, I have a air filtration unit attached to the ceiling. Thing there is that I haven't changed the filters recently and they need to be changed recently, frequently to uh, have a proper effect. And looking at that reminds me that the third leg of the air filtration system I haven't put back in place. I've got a four inch pipe there which should come down to be above the lathe or behind the lathe rather to collect uh, shavings as they come off and the other end of the pipe should be connected to the big hoover. Uh, unfortunately I'll move the hoover to this space when I put the new lathe in and I've been too lazy to actually put the big tube into place. I really ought to get around to doing that. Another area of safety uh, is the saw table. I have got the guide mounted and I have got a push stick device for pushing narrow pieces past the blade and underneath there is a hoover which connects in theory above and below the saw blade and I've wired it in so that the hoover automatically comes on when I switch the power on to the leg. Unfortunately, as I discovered, if I attach the uh, hose to the guard on the top of the machine, it pulls the guard out of place and I can't get the wood to go through. So I need to work out how I can attach the uh, hose on the top item to get the maximum benefit from that. Moving on, another issue is the, uh, the, the grinder. As you'll see, I've taken the uh, safety guard off the CBM wheel. And the main reason for doing that is so that I can use settings on the wheel so that I don't have to keep adjusting it all the time. I think that's a safe thing to do. The main reason for having the guard on is the old compound uh, wheels were in danger of breaking up and flying all over the place. One thing I can safely say about this uh, CBM wheel, it's very heavy steel. It is not going to break up and fly at me. Still tangle up. In progress. Um, and I've made sure that I've got good light so that I can actually see what I'm doing. Uh, the process of replacing the old strip lights with better LCD lights and much raising the light level. I think that's probably enough for now. Right, moving on. Yep, Jeff, over to you. H hang on one second. Terry, you made a comment halfway through the, oh, oh, right, yes. the end of the video. Yeah, there were a couple of points I saw on that, apart from the uh, general um, housekeeping issues. One is that there was the uh, a polishing mop in the lathe in a Jacob's chuck. Um, that's a bit risky unless it's got a draw bar. I don't know if it has, George. It uh, doesn't, actually. Well, the trouble with a Jacob's chuck on, on a Morse taper is it sits there quite happily until suddenly it decides it work, to work itself loose. Hmm. And it, it starts to rattle, but if it comes out too far, it can go start being flung about and, and could fly, the whole thing could fly. So I think that's a bit risky. If you're... Yeah, I'm... 
I'm always careful to keep a constant pressure on it. So yeah, it's well, actually... if, you're, if it's held in, that's okay. Um, uh, but uh, they they come loose almost by themselves. You could put a center up to support it. Yeah, yeah, but then not on that mop because you wouldn't be able to use it. No, that's true. Um, but as George says, I mean, you're working on the face of that mop. It's not not so bad. But but if you're putting a um, a wheel type mop on it, um, you've got sideways pressure then, um, and then you could use the tailstock. The other thing is uh, the CBN wheel, George rightly says they're not going to burst, but there's, you have to be careful of entanglement. Um, certainly long hair, but, but clothing too, uh, can, can wrap itself around a wheel, but and in, in a flash, or, you know, an instant, it's, it's pulled you in. That wouldn't happen if, if you're sensibly dressed for the job. Do you think you should wear short shirts, short sleeves when you're using these tools? Can, can we hold that for a minute and we'll come back to that. And I just wanted to show you our two workshops for the very reason that uh, Terry's just demonstrated that in any workshop, there are always things we can do to improve. And I'm grateful to Terry for the, for the things that He's mentioned, but we will be coming on specifically to use of machine minimized risk okay. right. shortly. So you can just hold the thought, we'll, we'll come to it. Sorry, George. No, that's okay. No, it's, uh, we do want people to join in. Uh, and this was the point where I was going to uh, get people to join in. Uh, Jeff, where are you? You're, you're going to do the talking, I'm going to do the writing. Okay, so we've already had a couple of um, items identified. Should you, three items even, what sort of clothing should you wear? You're going to write, write these up, George, presumably. Right, yeah. What sort of clothing? Um, so, do you wear, if you've got I long hair? I've got stupidity I, going there, so... Okay. Clothing. I don't think anybody in the club's got excessive long hair, but if you if it is long, perhaps you should think of wearing a hairnet. <laughs> or just get old and bald. <laughs> most, of it, most of us can do that. Um, yeah. I was trying to make it easy. Shoes. Anything boots. Else? Shoes. Yeah, boots. The main, the main safety, safety boots. Your safety boots, biggest yeah. area of risk in your workshop not the answer to it but what's the biggest area of risk anybody want to work. offer anything up the, yeah in their own the workshop what do they think is statistically risky uh, i guess breathing noxious dust dust yeah uh, okay statistically the, the dropping most... something dropping something did you say? yeah like dropping tools exactly. on. Statistically, well, the commonest accidents in, in workshops are people putting their backs out, people tripping over, um, people dropping things on their feet, certainly. Um, it's falls and bad backs. That's, that's what causes most accidents, and they're serious. But explosion and chemical risk. Well, yeah, there's a, there's a hazard, but the risk is, is very small. How about frustration and losing your temper? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, I, think that, yeah, I think we could sum that up by saying that the biggest risk in the workshop is the turner. <laughs> Get rid of him. risk. Complacency. Tiredness. Getting tired. Yeah. Well, we can cover that. But uh, what about things flying off the machine? Well, yeah. Bits of wood breaking off. Now that's got mm, to yeah. be not not a rare occurrence. Um, piece of wood not held properly in the chucks. Uh, yeah. Machine yeah. turning too fast. Piece um, breaking up. Burning faulty timber. Yes, I, I, I had a big mishandling a big of the tool. Chuck flying off, which I've had. I mean, after you've really? rounded after you've rounded your square piece of timber. You've got to move the chuck in. 
how many people forget then you've got a nice big gap developing for mm. your your tool to get caught and, and that will cause a, a hell of a hell of a bash especially if your face is near it yeah um i remember it wasn't that long ago when jonathan had his he was wearing um uh, a vi not just a visor pro pro proper proper headgear and something went off the went off the lathe smashed his visor and gave him a bruise on his head um so sometimes things can just because you're wearing something you don't want a false sense of security so the the, the, the word right at the very top it's cautious anybody else can, can think of anything complacency oh, i'm sorry complacency yeah you've done yeah. it once before so you don't yeah. think about you don't think about it yeah yeah the Is i'm it? an expert so i can ignore the safety rules because i understand them mm -hmm. mm. Fine. I know this is. I know this is dangerous, but I'm going to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Say. How about fire? Yeah. Yeah. Fire. Fire. Don't smoke whilst you're vacuuming up sawdust. <laughs> <laughs> or applying finish. Or applying finish. Yeah. Very true. Do we have mm -hmm. something about first aid? Because most of us turn in the shed on our own, and if we do injure ourselves or cut ourselves. Um, we may not be able to get help easily. Yeah, good point. Right, so you need a, te a telephone. A phone. Yeah. yeah. You need a telephone, yeah. you need a fire extinguisher, you need and a first a aid kit, all yeah. handy. Yeah. yeah. And have you told your manager, have you yeah, told I've, your manager where you yeah. are? I've got all of those, but I've also got a fridge with beer in it, which is also helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Non-alcoholic, of course. Yeah. You want to get one of those COVID vaccine fridges, Clint? Mm. Stop vodka. Yeah. Okay. Right, let's uh, move on. Working with wood. Forget about machinery and chemicals for a minute. What are the dangers with wood? All wood dust is potentially harmful. There is no safe wood dust. If you continually, continually put wood dust in your lungs, it can be nasty some yeah. of it like you is actually toxic it, toxic it contains poisons um, um and burn them some, M some MDF. Dust positive. Hmm? MDF. Sorry? yeah well that's that's carcinogenic because mm. not just poisonous isn't it with the yeah. all, all it. wood dust is carcinogenic yeah once it gets into your yeah. lungs it doesn't come out again yeah okay and I would say it's not just the dust and the, the sap in the wood can be quite nasty and there can be lichens and fungi there. Um, and things like spalting, if you're using spalted timber, timber, it's spalted because it's had a fungus in it. So if you're turning this, there are fungal spores in with the dust. Wood bark can contain all kinds of different um, fungi, lichens, poisons, insects. Um, so if you're doing a, a natural edge bowl, there, you know, there's always a, a risk coming from that. Um, anything that we've not mentioned about working with wood or that, uh, that isn't on the slide? Before <coughs> I move on to Jeff, who's going to explain how we deal with all of these. You know, the, you know the efficiency of the filters on the respirator? I mean, even if you've got it on, is it still dangerous? Technically, yes, because uh, most <coughs> filters only go down to half a micron. So dust can be uh, just on the atomic level. Um, so it's, it's, all, huge. A, it's huge. all a matter of com mm -hmm. common sense. You wouldn't want to be turning with a turning dusty wood all day long. I mean, if your tools are blunt, they'll produce more dust. And yeah, if we were no, just, just had a had a thought where where, you, where you're dealing with live uh, with bark etc. Um, there's one there's one item there. Lichens, lichens, just to not just to show off, but lichens are um, a symbiotic relationship between um, fungi, bacteria, and algae. Now, you do, you, it's not, not something you want to take off 
scrape it off with your hands and then maybe wipe your face later. You know, you're, we're talking about bacteria that we don't know what it is. They're only just making investigations into this. It's a huge subject, lichens and fungi. So I'd be particularly careful when you're cleaning up your timber just to get it, get it on the lathe. It, it's yeah, uh, yeah. got a big problem on its own. Okay, know your timber. Well, there are, we, we, we've got one of the websites which we can give you the address of, we'll give you that later. But if you can identify yeah. your timber, then you're going to know what some of the risks are. For example, will it, uh, is the dust dangerous? Will it sensitize my skin? Will it give me uh, asthma, um, et cetera? It's a bit better than putting a, a lump of wood on your machine and then turning away and hoping for the best. Um, it's, it's good to know what you're dealing with. Masks and respirators. Do you check your um, filters? Do you clean them out regularly? Uh, it's important because once a, a filter on your mask, it might not necessarily tell you that it's already choked up. And what will happen is it will block the air going through the, the air will be blocked going through the filter and you'll just have pure air and dust you're breathing in instead. So. Really, you should check those maybe every time, you know, at the end of the day or the, in the, in the, ne the next morning before you put your mask on, take the filters out and see if they need swapping. They're usually pretty cheap or, or they're washable, rinsable, worth doing. Dust extraction in your machinery. How often do you check that? If you've got uh, an air filtration plant, now I've got one of those big things that hangs in the in my garage, it's probably not a good idea to put it on while you're working because it will create a draft over you. It will drag the dust towards you. Probably best, I think David switches it on at the end of the session and then turns it off um, after, you know, yeah. an hour afterwards. So it's... it's uh... well, yeah, Jeff, can I just come in there and see if we can get yeah. views on that? Because some people would say you should always have the dust uh, extraction thing. Well, maybe. What do people think? It, doesn't it depend where you position it? Where you position it, yes. But wherever it is, it's going to drag air in. And if you, you could be in the firing line. Uh, I, I tend to switch it on when I finished so that, that the I'm not in the room, uh, I'm not in the workshop, and it'll... Yeah, so you dust, dust, is in, dust, is, dust is in the air all the time. Are you talking about the filters that hang up or, or the yes. dust extraction? Yeah, the filter that hangs up. Yeah. So you have a dust extractor going when you're working? Yes, that's something else. Yeah. This mm -hmm. is just to sort of clear the air. Um, there's always going to be dust. Soon when you're move, moving, moving yeah. around, is going to create dust um, yeah. clouds. Although running a dust extractor, it it's, uh, must act like one of those filters anyway, those ambient filters. Yes. They're not it's very powerful, but they do a job. They're doing the same job, yeah. Yeah. It's a I, good pers idea. I personally like using wet sanding because I, I use exotic timbers more than anything else. They tend to be nastier. Uh, but wet sanding has got its own um, advantages. Very little dust. Um, it also helps block up the pores of the wood. You get a better finish. It's a great... I use a lot. I do it a lot. And I usually use an oil. Um, I wouldn't use liquid paraffin because that never dries out, but uh, any other oil will do. Um, should you wear gloves? Personally, I think that's dangerous. Because gloves can get caught, um, you, you, especially if you're using uh, any sort of wool on a machine, you're wearing gloves. That, that can drag your finger in. Personal hygiene, well, I guess you should have a wash afterwards or maybe have a wash before you go in the workshop. That's hard, hard to tell. Um, what, what else are people worried about? What are they aware of in their own workshops that they think maybe well, I should be doing this? They know their, you know your own Look, workshops. One, one thing I'd like to say is, is to remind people who've got a dust extractor that it needs 
check it, checking, which you did mention, I think, Jeff. Yeah. Um, they can easily become partly clogged up and lose a lot of their suction. Um, and uh, certainly uh, when I clean the filters on mine, I do notice a difference. Yeah, yes, so you, you, should have, you should have some sort of schedule for it because they, the, the decline in the performance is very slow, very gradual. And there's, there's no, unless you suck up a carrier bag or something, which I've done before now, um, you don't notice a sudden change. Um, so you should schedule it for every three months or whatever it is, um, just to, to check the operation of a dust extractor. It's also a good idea to, to leave your doors wide open rather than have machines taking the dust out. Let, let the fresh air take the air out. Much nicer than having the door shut. It's a bit bloody cold at the moment. Is that well, true? <laughs> somebody <laughs> said that. <laughs> Put an extra sweater on. That's easy. <laughs> yes, who said standing behind a lathe was uh, healthy? Um, <laughs> but you don't generate any heat. Um, muscular energy is uh, exothermic you're not moving around it you can put 15 jumpers on it's not going to make any difference mm. and having a fire behind you maybe that's not a good idea no. No. If, if you do it should not have a source of ignition you could have an oil filled radiator yeah or you could have an air blower uh, water heater uh something like that but nothing with a burner absolutely but there yes. are, aren't the special um, wood burners for big workshops. Mm. I've seen them in some of the turners. Yeah, a lot of the tutors have them as well, but uh, it's asking for trouble. Right. You shouldn't smoke. You shouldn't fun. smoke. You shouldn't smoke while you're turning either. <laughs> well, electric convectors are safe. Yeah. Yes, if they're working properly. Yeah. yeah. I started a fire with a with an agropoise lamp. The um, shavings got uh, into the uh, shade around the bulb and started smouldering. Oh, really? So you there just you go. That's, so that's use uh, you use LED bulbs. Which that you, was tungsten bulb. Probably pre LED. It okay. was yes. And I, I've had a, a fire in in a force in a bit. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, doing a deep bore. And it was, it, the, the bit was getting blunt and getting hot, and I hadn't noticed it. And when I extracted it, it was smoking. And as I was watching the air waft across from the uh, extractor, it started to glow. But I it quickly extinguished that with some water because if that goes in the extractor, that would have been a nightmare. There, there are some very. Uh... There are fire hazards knocking around that you pr probably haven't appreciated. Obviously, dust dust is explosive if you're not careful. Yeah. Uh, fine dust can go bang. Um, the biggest problem in a flour mill. Uh, yeah. Du yeah. D uh, dusty cobwebs are a serious fire hazard because a spark can run along um, a cobweb. If we were running a factory, one of my one of my friends uh, had a foot had a furniture factory and um, when his insurance man came around uh, to, to check it before they were going to give him a policy he says see those dusty cobwebs you've got to get rid of them because when the factory inspector comes around he'll he'll tell your place is dangerous so that's something else that you perhaps wouldn't have thought of or even noticed I mean I've got an old garage and I've got spiders in there and they leave cobwebs so it's something it's very easy to hoover up and get rid of, but uh, they, they can't, they're potentially dangerous. Anybody got any other thoughts about their workshops? How the many of us have fire extinguishers in the well, workshops? Can, can we come to fire extinguishers in a moment? It's the dangers of, of wood specifically at the moment. We'll, we'll come to fire extinguishers. Sure. Sorry. Uh, no, that's okay. Sure. Uh, yeah, let, well, let's just finish uh, our bit on the wood. And what I will attempt to do is another bit of technology, <laughs> if this works. You should, at the moment, well, if this is... 
still sharing. Uh, yeah. Yes, it's there. The Wood Database, we were talking about earlier, uh, is an excellent site. And you can put in things, if I can spell it right, just to illustrate. Oh, you do get adverts. So one of the things I like about this site is it does both the common name and the scientific name. You don't, don't always know uh, both. Uh, and it's a useful site in that it tells you the properties of the wood. It tells you how workable it is, but also it talks about toxicity. Uh, in this case, Reactions are uncommon, but laburnum contains the toxine cytosine, uh, which can be fatal, um, but it can cause nausea and vomiting and headache. So it's one to be be aware if you know, whether your wood uh, has specific things. And there are some fairly common woods like laburnum that are in themselves quite risky. Uh, can you post that website, please? Yes, I certainly can. It's a, an excellent website that I can recommend. It has lots of uh, stuff on it. Um, it has things like how to identify that wood. And if you're like me, you buy the wood and then you've forgotten what it is, or you go along and pick it up from a site and you've forgotten what it is. Mm. Uh, so there's hints here on uh, how to identify a wood, starting with a fairly obvious, <laughs> is it actually solid wood? Um, so it's got things like that, uh, and I can get it to work. Uh, it's also got specific health and safety uh, information about individual woods, uh, and it lists them by species, the sort of effect that it can have, whether it's going to affect your hands, your eyes, or your lungs, and how potent the effect is likely to be. So if you're is, this wood, a, it's, is it a book or a database? It's, mean, a, database. You, it's a database. It's, it's online. Both. Can you buy it as a book? Yeah. <laughs> it's on the home page of the website. It's just funny. Well, let's have a look. Home page. I've only ever looked at it online. Ah, there we are. It is available as a book. Why would you want it as a book? The wood database, yeah. The wood database. I'll send the link, link uh, yeah. around, as I say. It's very useful, uh, and it's got things that fit in with some of the discussions we've been having online recently, like drying wood at home, and what's, what sorts of uh, finish will work on what sorts of wood. So it's a site that I can, I can recommend looking at if you're not familiar with it, and if you've used it just to look up woods, it's worth knowing that there's quite a lot of other very useful information on there. Mm. So I'll, I will send around the link. Uh, so let's go back to this and now working with machinery. We've been attempting, very few have been attempting to move on to this, but let's, let's get on there. Uh, Jeff, what, what are the risks of working with machinery? Well, I, I, I guess we, we all know what these are, fast moving parts. Uh, We've touched on this already. Um, w when you start your machine up, do you make sure that the everything is as it should be, that the uh, tool rest is, is fixed in the correct position? Because you don't want it to go half a turn and then bang into the tool rest. Um, tools must be sharp because there's nothing worse than a blunt tool. It'll skid and dig into either the piece of wood or your hand if you're very unlucky. Um, manual handling. Is your machine off before you turn it round? Um, I, I see lots of demonstrators, we've all seen them, uh, where they take, they do a bit of measuring and they take their um, measuring tool in one hand and use use the cutting tool with the other hand. So they're just using one hand. And I think it's very bad for a demonstrator to do that online or, or in front of an audience because it's 
it's asking for trouble. Um, if you, you the, the, um, the calipers, that's the word I was trying to think of. And the calipers are normally made with a, a hard edge. And unless you round it over, it's going to catch on your bit of wood and bounce up and down. It's going to be a lovely thing. Um, falling and tripping. Well, uh, you saw, a, you might remember my, my uh, workshop, stuff all over the floor. Never seem to manage to tidy up before the last job. And then the new job comes along and still the old bits of wire are still there. Electricity, which George has um, made, made a point of issue that he's got an RCD in there um, and the lights and the power are separated. And what about the noise? Does anybody wear earphones in a workshop? I, yeah. person, I personally don't. Colin does. Yeah, uh, I've started. Main, mainly because the dust extractor is so noisy. OK, yes, it's, it's true. Um, I, I actually was, uh, I went for a hearing test not so long ago and uh, was asked about the noise in my workshop so i've been measuring it and actually astonishingly to me it isn't very noisy the yeah. maximum yeah. noise i've recorded is 74 decibels Nothing. it's not because you're deaf is it i mean you went along there for a test it's not it's not it's not me running the decibel count yeah but you know yeah. that oh, but i was turning one day and my next door neighbor came around to complain about the noise <laughs> yeah, noise. <laughs> noise. It's, it's relative, it's isn't it? Yeah. House, and he said if he was it's... trying to read in his front room, and he couldn't because of the noise of my lathe. Yeah, if noise. It's Eighty-five noise. decibels averaged over eight hours, then it's becoming harmful. Yeah, but and, the thing and is, it's highly unlikely we would achieve that. No, the th the thing is with noise though, it's not the measurement; it's how appropriate it is to the setting. It can be not very loud, but really offensive, or it can be really loud and not offensive. Oh, that's it, a different thing, isn't it? It might yeah. annoy the neighbours, but yeah. but uh, it's not a safety risk unless um, no. it's exactly. uh, over the exposure limit. Exactly. Yeah. If anybody's interested, you can get uh, easily downloaded decibel meters for your smartphones. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's useful. But you wear one over each ear. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Jeff. A any other? Anybody got any other things that they they think the workshop should uh, have? Well, I've got a um, one of those big red button uh, switches um, that I use when I connect particularly dangerous kit like a router. Um, I, I don't have my lathe attached to it because it's got its own big red button. Um, but for other stuff, that might be worth it. You can get them from Axminster. The foot pet, the foot switch is quite useful, especially on a bandsaw. So as soon as you take your foot off the, the pedal, it'll go off. Yeah, I, I fitted one up to my table saw because I found if I was trying to cut a very awkwardly shaped piece of timber, you can't get your hand, you're holding it with two hands, yeah. how, how, do you, how do you switch the thing off? Yeah. So yeah. I fitted up a, an NVR uh, foot pedal which I bought and wired it in and it's brilliant. Mm. Just take your foot off, it freezes, it's, it's terrific. Um, Doesn't that lose your balance though? If you've got one foot balance. No, I've got it. I've got it next to my foot, so I only have to move my foot a couple of inches, and it's off. You switch you keep your foot on the pedal. On. Well, well I, I I press it. Sorry, I don't lift it off. I press it, so it's next to my foot. I always make sure when I'm in there, it it's next to my foot, so I can mark it easily. But I found it dreadfully dangerous if I was holding a piece of wood with two hands. Uh, how do you turn the machine off? Ridiculous. So they what are these things called, Jeff? NVR foot switches? Well, no, no, that, that's a non-voltage return. That's just once you turn the power off, it, it can't, when you release the pressure, you, it can't turn itself back on. It has to be switched on. It's the sort of switch you would have on all the other machines. They're all called NVRs. But I, I bought this little lever switch uh, off the website. It was about seven quid, wired it up. Um, earthed it and it works fine. A no Joe, Joe, relay. Sorry? A no voltage relay. Yes, there you go. That, that's the official acronym. <laughs> that sounds like very good uh, advice because I've got one of the old fashioned lathes where it doesn't have a, a movable control box and the positioning of the on off switch 
is directly beneath the truck. Mm. It could be quite dangerous sometimes. If I feel I need to switch off quickly, I've got you to can't. reach down very close to the spinning wood. Yeah. Mm. Yes, if you're noticing something going wrong on the turning, you're the wrong side of the chuck to reach the button. Absolutely, yeah. Do yeah. people have their tools on the other side of the wall and they might lean over a turning lathe to change the tool? A bit dicey. Yes, very dicey. But I'm an expert. Also, so, yeah, <laughs> I, I know it's, I, I'm taking extra care. Mm -hmm. Also, use of a chainsaw, oh, yes, which is particularly dangerous. Sorry? Chain, use of a chainsaw. Oh, yeah, well, that's, that's another matter, yeah. That's another story, isn't it? Yeah. But the thing is, <laughs> just don't take the chainsaw while you're turning. <laughs> <laughs> What's that, Tom? I think, David, it would worry me if you'd heard what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I avoid chainsaws. <laughs> and one thing I'd like is a lathe that automatically switches down to minimum speed when I turn it off. Because I've many a time been caught out by uh, mounting something new in the lathe, switching it on and forgetting that I had it on a high speed. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I... I haven't yet switched the lathe on with the chuck key in place. Ah, oh, it does happen. I I've have. come close to it a few times. <laughs> it's quite exciting. <laughs> yes, it is. You never know what's going to be in the way of it. <laughs> the same on the pillar drum. If you leave the chuck in, that's yep. fine. I can testify to that one. Jeff, oh. I've been looking for your uh, pedal switch, which I think is a great idea. I can't find it online. Can you post the uh, link to where you got yours? I'll have to find one. Yeah, I mean, I bought, I bought it. Must have bought it about ten years ago. Um, ah, I've I'll just. See, found well, one. I'll, I'll have, a, I'll have a look. Oh, on. Check on the RS components and for a heavy duty foot switch. I've just actually found one somewhere else as well. Okay, RS components. You think? Yeah. Probably better than what I've just found. I can post the link if you want. Oh, and great! Thanks, Adam. Yeah, please. Don't, don't forget to earth it. Well, it's standing on the earth often, anyway. Isn't it? <laughs> That often they just come with <laughs> often they just come with um, two wire connections. Make sure you earth it as well, even if it give it an earth if it hasn't got one. Have we covered everything? Well, there's just one other the one little thing. It's worth what, that, sorry, I was going to say one thing that's worth watching out for is, is wax on wood. If you get a bowl blank with wax on it, as soon as you turn it, the wax ends up on the floor in the shavings and it builds up on the floor and it becomes a skating rink. Ordinary yeah. sawdust can do that as well, of course, depending on the condition of the floor underneath. But uh, I, That's a thought. I, I teach, um, well, before the virus came around, I used to teach turning at a Camden shed, which has a, a very nice, smooth floor, than it was this. Um, and after um, people were working on these waxed blanks from styles and boats, you could hardly stand up on that floor. So we, <laughs> we had to, um, we had to uh, clean it with special solvent. Um, we had to um, try and cut the wax off on a bandsaw. <laughs> so um, that's another what, hidden, that's a hidden danger, isn't it? It is. Something you wouldn't think of. One, one other area, you mentioned about the risk of electricity shocks and things. If you're doing any work that involves getting into the electrics, you can get a thing called an isolating transformer, which if you supply whatever it is you're working on through an isolation transformer, you won't get an electric shock. Hmm. Well, that's not okay. a conversation. That it certainly has. I'm trying to work out exactly what... Hmm. An isolating transformer <laughs> simply means that the power that you're using is from a secondary on a transformer, 
and it doesn't go down to earth. So you won't ever represent the path back to earth. Okay. Doesn't stop so, you getting the shock across two terminals, though. Oh, you could get a shock across two terminals, but it's never going to be as powerful as one that goes down to earth. So as an electronics person, you often worked in an entirely isolated transformer setup. Hmm. It has to be quite big to uh, run a workshop. It, yeah, you'd have to be selective in what you ran on it because the power would go up and you'd need a huge hmm. transformer if you were doing the whole workshop. i just throw that one in. I knew an electrician once who never bothered to switch off the electrics before he did a job. So That's he me. stood on a rubber mat. I, no, that, I do that. I would work live and in my previous days I would even touch a wire to see if it was live. You wouldn't lick it? No I wouldn't lick it but I would touch it with the back of my finger and get a shock to know if it was live. What's yeah. wrong with your tonsil? <laughs> <laughs> you could do a Covid test then as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> See, one of the, the best things I got when I first started turning, and I thought it was a luxury at the time, I got a dedicated uh, Turner smock, which zips up right up to the front, keeps everything in, has tight cuffs. Yeah, I got one of those. And the yeah, I, use, I use one of those. They're brilliant. Yeah. Put them over your best shirt. Yeah. Anyway, so moving on, other risks. Um, we've talked about a few, but there's a, uh, we've uh, mentioned uh, tiredness and impaired judgment uh, before uh, and overconfidence. <laughs> One thing that I'm not sure has been mentioned is um, oily rags. If you've been applying your uh, finish, an awful lot of our, the finishes we use in wood turning are capable of spontaneous combustion. And if you simply throw a wet, a rag wet with uh, your uh, your oil finish in the bin, you uh, you are taking risks. Someone once said, I think it was Tom, that he puts it in a glass jam jar afterwards. Yeah, exactly. I've actually covered the uh, glued onto the outside of the glass jam jar some router matting so I don't smash it. Um, and I just stick every little bit of stuff in there, and then I throw it away in a in a plastic. Um, uh, bag a bin liner with no holes and put that in the dustbin. Um, throw the contents of the jar into the bin liner and, and then the bin liner in the dustbin and then reuse the jam jar. Mm. What, what, can, what to use rags at all, isn't it? Yeah. Um, if you're yeah, it's not just rags, it's rag, it could easily catch. I use yep. um, paper towels to polish. And conventions usually suggest that you flatten the rags out and let them dry before yeah. you, rather than just leave them all screwed up. That's it. I put mine on the concrete overnight. Yeah, that's what I do. Use a paper. Another, another fire risk is steel wool. Yeah, oh, that yeah. is nasty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I've got a big blue paper roll on them, so I use that. Yeah, we haven't covered fumes, of course. Um, they they they're you can, lovely. You can get knocked out by those in more ways than one. They're wonderful. <laughs> and if I can, ju I just rem remembered uh, it was about three or four years ago. Uh, I I was I made a. Um, a dead center out of a piece of dense wood that I had, only a small thing, and I had to take my face mask off because I could not get close enough and um, breathed in some of the dust, as you do. Anyway, that night I woke up, woke up and I was laying on my bed, wide awake, and I was seeing sparks going around the ceiling. And I, it, Brian suggested that I was hallucinating. I haven't had the wood identified, but it was South American. Mm. <laughs> it was a nasty experience. I felt ill that evening, got over that, but waking up and seeing your, your room go round in circles, that, that was horrifying. Anyway, I've still got the uh, dead centre. It works. 
I'll get it identified eventually. But South, some nasty South America. It just shows you what's in timber that you don't expect. Any other nasty things knocking around? What we haven't covered are the specific things that you have to watch when you're using particular machines. I'm thinking in terms of the bandsaw, you've got to make sure that you're not your, the wood is supported underneath the cutting edge. So if you're doing a cutting a log, you've got to support it somehow to stop it rolling into the blade. And there's things like that, specific techniques on each of your machines you've got to watch out for. Yeah. Yeah, that goes along with you know, RTFM, read the manual. Um, be aware of how your machine is going to react when you uh, introduce bits of wood to it. Um, you're absolutely right there, Brian. Well, it's an easy trap to fall into. You pick up a round piece of wood, I'll cut it, you're, bang, you've, you've lost it. Broke the, yeah. broke the blade, <laughs> probably just a bit of still losing your hands. <laughs> yeah, I think we've uh... <clears throat> just uh, some other things. Um, you shouldn't be using machinery when you are tired, uh, certainly not when you've been drinking. But if you are taking, um, if you're on medication or you're taking a cold or flu remedy, do you always check what it says about uh, operating machinery? Lots of even over the counter medicines have warnings on them. Yeah. If you're not feeling 100%, don't go there. And if somebody changes your medication, make sure you're aware of what the side effects are likely to be. We've mentioned keep a phone handy. If you're on your own, something happens, you need to be able to get in touch with people. And Actually, on that subject, George. Me. Sorry? On, on that subject, I, when I fitted my um, safety switch, somebody pointed out that it really ought to be no doubt. If I was knocked over and on the floor. Sorry, Tom, I was getting, getting a bit distracted by what else was happening there. I was saying that when I fitted my safety switch, um, uh, I was reading about the general issues and it was pointed out that it should be low down so that if you're knocked over by whatever um, disaster yes. has occurred, you can get to the switch from the floor. Oh, good point. Yes, good so point. if you're being electrocuted, you're not going to be able to get up to, uh, to reach the switch on the ceiling. That's quite right. Exactly. Yeah, you're getting into the realms of the red button that elderly folk need to wear. So that if they fall down, they can just press the button. Well, there's a thought maybe we should all have one hanging around our neck. Mm. Mm. Well, what, what would the red button do, Jeff? Would it turn off the electricity or would it call for oh, help? No, the red button would call for help. My dad used to have one and if he pressed it, somebody in Bristol would, would uh, get back to him immediately. Yeah, but Cliff, we've already <laughs> foreseen the kind of disaster where the lanyard it's hanging on will be yeah, caught on the piece you're exactly, turning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have to have it pinned in so it can't swing. <laughs> Every risk has another risk. How many people have got a fire extinguisher? I got, yeah. I got one. And if you and have, I put it outside the workshop. It's, no, it's inside the workshop. Hanging on I the put wall. It, I put it just outside because I figure that the most likely time of risk is after I've left the bloody workshop. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Look out the front door and see the garage burning down. I've got a heat alarm in the in the workshop that tells me if the temperature's got too hot. No point in putting a, a, um, a smoke alarm in because of course it'll get clobbered by the dust. Yeah, um, I've actually but, got two, but they're pinned on the door frame inside the, the door. So it's right by the door. And ha -ha, does that send a, give you a warning inside your house? Yeah, well, I, I looked for a version that did and I paired it with another one that I got, a, a gas monitor that's next door in the utility room. Um, and then they, they signal to each other and they're, they're independent from the main fire alarm uh, uh, setup we've got. The same, the, the, the smoke alarms that are all over the house um, are on a different system. But these two work together and hopefully will make enough noise to wake me up. Yeah. That's very interesting. Mm. But so, do you all think we should have fire extinguishers in the workshop? Well, that's where I've got mine. Yeah. 
I, I was working on the basis that the fire, if it's going to happen, is going to be while I'm in there doing something that I shouldn't, starts the fire. I need to be able to grab the extinguisher and put it out. You can't leave them outdoors anyway. In the house, but you know, outside the door. Yeah, cool. I'll move on. Thanks. We've got a hot li hotline to the local fire station. It'll be hot, all right, when they're needed. Mm. We'll be on strike. <laughs> <laughs> but the, what the first, to us? The first aid kit, is, I think, is a really good, good one. You need yeah. it. So, anyway, have we covered all the things that we uh, put on that list in the first place? Stupidity, clothing, long hair, dust, tripping. Dropping, chemical risks, tiredness, flying objects, complacency. If I, yeah, so I think we probably have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of things on dust I wanted to raise. Um, yeah, go on. Uh, uh, stemming mainly from what you said earlier on. Um, you can vacuum those air filters in the, uh, in the space cleaners. What are they called? The boxes that you hang from the ceiling. Um, in fact, I vacuum mine. The ambient filters. The what? An ambient air filter. Yes, that's it. The external filter is the one that gets uh, the most wear and tear, the most dust, and you can access that from the outside. And interestingly, I noticed you've got exactly the same thing as I've got, George, and um, I just cut off the cardboard slats across the front that stopped me from getting the vacuum cleaner against the filter surface. Um, and I just do it regularly, once a week or something. Um, and, and the other thing, um, when I looked at my dust extraction, um, I was using a Dyson vacuum cleaner, and they, of course, don't clog. They fill up, but they don't clog, so you get constant uh, suction. And it was nowhere near strong enough to suck the dust off my uh, saw table. Um, mm. So I just connect now my extractor to the bottom outlet. So I've got exactly the same problem as you with the top outlet. There's no chance of that working. Um, you need a, something coming down from the ceiling for that. Hmm. So you don't need to use a vacuum cleaner, you need to use an extractor. I think the complacency thing is an important one. <clears throat> so, for instance, if you need to move your tool rest up a quarter of an inch because you're using a scraper instead of a gouge, you might think, oh, I can't be bothered, it's only one cut. But I've made a point of actually doing the very small movements that you might not bother with because I don't want to be complacent. So the different tools require different different distances to the center line. And I always, ma always make sure that you adjust the tool rest to get your tool on the right, on the center line or wherever it should be, just above if it's a scraper. So adjusting the tool rest is an important thing, but you can, being complacent, you might think, oh, I can't be bothered, it's only one cut. And the next thing you know is you get a catch. Yeah or worse. Or, or not turning the lathe off when you adjust the tool rest and you know, the fingers are going to be close to that point. Yeah, you leave the lathe running while you go and get a cup of tea. No, leave the <laughs> 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 then, then have to extract your dog from it. <laughs> what sort of fire extinguishers do you have? Because there's Outer. different types, aren't there? Powder. Powder. Okay. You can only use powder. And is that for electrical powder? Because you don't know whether the risk is electrical, liquid, gas, or powder covers all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can I raise you one use it? On the list? Um, what about security? Most of us have got sheds at the bottom of a garden. Yeah. Cleaning several thousand pounds worth of kit. That's a good one. Are these pieces covered by our household insurance or what? Does the shed have to be a certain distance from the house? No, that's a really important covered? question. Really important question. Well, usually uh, you'll find that uh, it's, if it's any one item, i.e. if you've got a lathe over 2,000, I don't know what, what particular figure will be, it's usually any one item. They wouldn't classify the workshop as... The whole thing's worth 50 grand. Um, 
when I when I told my insurance company about my workshop, they said, "Well, what are the items worth?" And there's nothing worth uh, that tripped over. I think it was something like three thousand. This is nothing near near that at all. But you ought to check with your insurance company. The important thing about insurance yeah. or, or, or security is that, that any burglar can walk into your lay into your workshop with a club hammer or a crowbar or something and break into your house really easy and i'm afraid i you know my doors are open all the time right? i don't know yeah well you've uh, got to have a decent lock locking system well you, you should do but i don't when he was fixed an alarm linked to the house security no no no, I, I, my burglar alarm does include a sensor in the garage. I've got a wireless one and it does. And it's very good because I've gone in there um, from outside and the alarm's bug have gone off. <laughs> yeah. So I've got to turn the house off before I can get into my shed. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Good idea. Sensible. What kind of sensor is it? It's a wireless sensor that goes oh, into sensor. the main system. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, it's not too near the house, but it's near enough that it, it actually works. That's handy. Hmm. Hmm. I know my uh, insurance only covers a maximum of £5,000 for any item in a shed. That should cover most things. That should cover everything, shouldn't it? Except for Lave. Not if it's the total amount at, at risk. No, it's an individual item. Well, mine, mine's an overall figure. Okay. And I think it, I'm sure it's five thousand pound in total. That will cover the screws. That will cover my screws. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if yeah. you haven't made sure that your doors lock, are you covered at all? Generally, not. Um, if it's not locked, it won't be covered in my policy. It's been negligence, yes. Yeah. Well, that's really important. Anyway, moving on, um, possible sources of further information. Jeff? Well, um, who, who are our health and safety officers? Um, I don't think we, as a club, ha have really. Uh, established who they are um, maybe that's something that we should be bringing up a, a committee and uh, stick it on the website when we've done it um, there are lots of health and safety websites uh, health and safety the executive have, have got one and they've got their own wood database as well um, and there's all, obviously the uh, Google is the, has got the answer for most things. If you're not sure about anything, it's it's on the web. Um, books are books always need updating, and they're usually very expensive. Um, my first call would be as a member of the club, because one of the fans and how would I do about whatever it is. Sorry, George, that was all rather a bit muffled. Like somebody was talking. At Sorry. Well, one of our best sources of information is other members of the club. <coughs> if you come across a novel situation, uh, there's a chance that uh, other members in the club will have come across it before. That's true. That's true. Mm. Which brings us on to what as a club do we need to do to improve health and safety. For example, we have the lathes up at club meetings when we have them. Who is responsible for ensuring that they're being used safely? Is anybody in the club taking that responsibility? Mm, well, we, we have appointed somebody. Have we, got, have we got standard practices? Now, we're setting up lathes and setting out the tools. Have we got some guidance in place as to what needs to be done before you switch the thing on, particularly if we're getting new members in who are coming in to give it a try? Um, who takes responsibility for making sure that they know what the safety rules are? Mm. 
We yeah, have not, novices as well who haven't got a clue, might, might not even picked up a, a spanner. Yeah. That's yeah. All. Um, yeah, that's yeah. what we need to look at more carefully. I suppose the people who are in charge of the lathe need to have the health and safety responsibility as well. That's not that's that's not that should be they need to know that they've got that responsibility. I, I would suggest that that's a responsibility that res, uh, resides with whoever is running the evening. I would caution against having uh, rules and procedures, operating procedures that are in a manual, because then you end up with really complicated documents that nobody reads, and it sort of goes the wrong way. But if you've yeah, got three sense. lathes, if you've got three lathes running through an evening, you actually need three <laughs> people in control. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. Well, I, I think um, one person can't look at three different people working on a lathe. No, I agree. Well, you, can you, I almost, you almost need one instructor per lathe. Yeah. So one health and safety officer, by nature, yeah. by nature of the beast, someone who can check before switching on the lathes that they are sound and adequate, and the tools are correct. But actually, you do need three people with three. The number of people you need equals the number of people who number of lathes that you have. I think it's premature to discuss this now. What we need to do is draw up a list of things that need to be agreed and put them on the agenda for a committee meeting to be held prior to when we actually get back into the clubhouse. Yeah, I mean, that's very fair. That makes a, a lot of sense. I think what the current today's debate throws up to me is we've not thought through all of these health and safety issues. And that, I think yeah. as a committee, we need to get, uh, get a grip. Yeah. Can I, can I come in here? Um, as you know, the insurance company that we use has been hot on risk assessment. And we have an outstanding action to risk assess our use of the uh, hole. And it's part way through being done. Now, if I can get to share screen, I'll show you what I mean. Um, so I you have to probably take can. Over, George. So uh, I think that's down to uh, yeah. everyone. Everyone can share screen. Can I share um, screen? Share yes, screen you can off. now. Oh. Right. See everybody. So if I share screen, uh, do we see that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now we can. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's, it's a general risk assessment procedure. So you've got all of the things down here that are hazards and, and who's affected, the risk associated with it, the current controls, and then you rate the severity, probability, uh, and then you get a, a risk rating according to this table here. So if you've got a probability of three and a, and a risk of two, then it's a medium risk, right? So that get, that gives you the uh, things to focus on to, to for improvement, and then you've got the revised controls that you put in place to reduce the risk. Now, there's still an outstanding action, and it's not not a finished job. Uh, I, I'm not putting myself up to be the health and safety officer, but I was going through this risk assessment for the insurer to make sure that we were covered for our insurance. Um, but that could be the foundation for mm. what we do in terms yeah. of monthly meetings to assess the risk. Yeah, I mean, to my eyes, I think you put your finger on it with the severity bit by saying members working in pairs. I mean, if there was going to be a regulation, I would suggest you don't allow anyone, particularly a newcomer, to be working on a lathe alone. Mm. As long as there's an experienced person with a newcomer, you've, you've taken steps. 
Uh, if yeah. I come, take your point up there, the severity rating, you can see that the minor injuries, cuts, bruises, etc., yeah. requiring first aid, moderate, likely to need mm -hmm. medical referral, major, likely to need hospital care, yes. death, uh, multiple deaths. Mm -hmm. I hope we're never going to get into that. Several, sho several shovels. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you could get to a situation where you have got a risk that's a death. Uh, I, I don't anticipate that in our, our uh, hall, but so does that sort of cover you for a framework for that discussion on uh, what we do about um, managing meetings? I think it's a starting point, probably for our April meeting. Yeah, talk through. Okay, how do I unchair that? <laughs> Um, there we go. Right for you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I've just got one slide left, which I'll attempt to uh, share. Uh, there we go. Uh, there we are. Uh, that's not the last. That's it. Well, we've we've covered this. Use your common sense. Always have a phone handy. Don't make important decisions. I mean, the, the piece will still be there. It's it's classic, isn't it? You've finished working. You've taken all your gear off. You've dusted down. You pick up your piece of work to take in to gloat over it. And you, oh, there's a bloody scratch still on it. And then you go and stick it on the lathe and generally bugger it up or worse. Um, be patient. Uh, it's tomorrow's another day. Um, mm -hmm. I make all my mistakes when I finish turning. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. Yes. Yeah. You go that little bit too far. Yeah. <laughs> Perfectionism is dangerous. <laughs> yeah, and you know, you're only doing that one thing. You don't need to take all the precautions that you started off taking earlier. Absolutely. Oh, I don't need to put my helmet on. I don't need to do this. It's asking for trouble. It's always the last finishing bit that we, the, the uh, park gets wrecked. Yeah. yeah. There is yeah. A, it's because there you're is tired saying. You're tired, and you're complacent. <laughs> there is also a saying that says perfection is the enemy of the good. Yeah, I, I just said that. It's dangerous thing. Yeah. 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 yeah, I like that. Right, so that's, that's it from... Uh...